Welcome back, you fine folks, to the Brightworks. Today, we've got a very high skill level game that I'm personally extremely excited for. The Return of Z. Whether or not Z knows it, they've been a tremendous inspiration for the way that I play the game. I've watched quite a great number of theirs to learn how to play the game, and so I was super excited to find this game where they're playing, and indeed they're playing a semi-backline position, although not entirely out of position if they wanted to help the front. So I think this will be a phenomenal game for focusing on someone who really knows how to play the late game and help their team while they're doing it. Now on the other team, there's a few other names that I recognize as well. Quad Opti, Snied. We have Lee as well, which is shown in quite a few of my recent videos, actually, now that I think about it. Mouse is a new name. I don't recognize that one as well as reconfigured here. But they are all true skill over 20, I believe, all reconfigured, that might not be true, but all higher true skill nonetheless. So I am personally extremely excited to see how this game goes. As far as lineups, we have bots down here for Maus, or Maus, and we have vehicles for Geondir, Geo, Goendir. The O is before the E, so it's Goendir, interesting. Very interesting. Raven X, also a player I recognize. Excited to see what he's going to do here. I wonder if he's going to go for a eco focus or if he's going to push out units to help the front line. Kalamona, pushing out a few early scout units. You know I love to see it. I'm a big fan of harassment as long as it's in good sportsmanship and, of course, in a video game only. Let's keep it clean on the streets there, folks. We have reconfigured with some scout craft as well. He's going to find. Probably the scout craft of the enemy, which is good to find, early on at least. Even if it is overwhelming to your numbers. Looks like there's going to be a bit of an engagement here. Ooh, and they turn around just in time to avoid killing an enemy unit. Clutching defeat from the jaws of victory. Up north we have W.T. Sherman pushing up excitedly already. Looks like he's going to be holding the front line here, while Gael... We'll call that. I'll, we'll just we'll just call that player Gale. That's that's probably what that is. Looking to claim some of these frontline mexes here. With this bot, little WT Sherman, wraps around to claim this metal extractor, likely this metal extractor, and hopefully the hill as well. Now on this map, I definitely like to play bots on the front line here. And one thing that I'll do sometimes is I'll send an anti-air bot really early on, like my first or second bot, and I'll just send it up here. Because sometimes what you'll see is a cheeky play where a backliner will use a transport to move their commander up to this area. So if they send that transport and you happen to have the anti-air, boom goes their commander when the transport falls. Very cheeky trick to you. Brought to you. Very, very tricky trick. Very sneaky trick for you. Boy, do not attempt these sentences at home, ladies and gentlemen. Very tricky trick for you to attempt. But it can give you a tremendous advantage to knock out a commander with a simple light anti-aircraft. If you're still here after that sentence, uh, congratulations, first and foremost. And if you like more butchered sentences and interesting commentary of that sort, please consider subscribing. I'm sure there will be plenty more for you to enjoy in the future. At least one a day, if not two. If not three, we'll see how this channel grows and how much time I have to give it. We will see. Just like we see some skirmishing happening up here on the north. Grunt versus Grunt means there's not going to be much kiting potential. But we do see some of Red's supporting pawns here pushing in to help secure the advantage. And an advantage it will be for W.T. Sherman, who is now looking extremely rich in the metal extractor department. Pomabama getting ready to self-destruct his commander. His or her commander. I noticed I have like a 2% female audience, so I guess I have to be gender inclusive now. Rather, I should be. Wow, what an excellent play here. Using the using the construction turret to pick up the commander wreckage. Somehow I had never thought about that, and it manages to spare him from having to make a res bot. Huh. Well, we're all learning something new today. Look at that. Apparently, your commander can self-destruct within the range of a construction turret without damaging it. Good to know. 
reconfigured here, helping the front line, and quite a help it is indeed, because just an extra commander up here is going to allow Kuverti, Kuverti to secure this front line. Actually, I'm reading this completely wrong. Naps is on the, or reconfigured is on the other team. He's just in front of his line of turrets, which confused me immensely. <laughs> In fact, this is not a, a commander from the back line, although Lee is coming up, just like I said, to help with this front line construction. Don't hate that at all. Don't appreciate reconfigured confusing me like that, but that's all right. I'm sure he didn't mean it intentionally. And if he did, I forgive him. Got some pounders being a pain in the neck here for this group of grunts that wants to go harass. Quad Opti also looking to move forward here, but there is going to be a armed exploiter. Now, do these have the bonus against commanders? They do. Now, Quad Opti hops on this immediately. Knows not to let that go up, or else it's going to cause tremendous grief to his commander. But he does take a few shots for it. All said and done, probably worth it, though. A few of these pounders here. Going to scuff up some of these other units. And probably get a wonderful hit off on these grunts. Very dangerous to push into those with those light units. Very, very dangerous. A little bit of coaching here from Z. Trying to instruct about where these units should be. Indeed, you don't want to just sit them in the back line. You do want them pushed up to the front, but I'm sure all these players are very well aware of it. Like I said, this is a high skill lobby. This is a lot of players that have played quite a few games and I'm sure are well aware of what they're doing. I will nitpick, however, because that is my job. Now, don't, don't get it twisted. Don't forget that I, uh, I am nowhere near as good as some of these players. I may have beaten them. My team may have beaten them. But uh, I come to you with the news that I can see in front of me. Whereas all these players are operating on a limited amount of information to make their strategic decisions. So easy for us to judge from the sidelines. Very difficult for them to make the right decision. I guess that gives us a sort of drama that we can enjoy. Revel in the misfortunes of others. <laughs> as cruel as that sounds. But it does make for some interesting matches, just like this one. If you played Beyond Our Reason for a while, you've probably seen DSDR quite a lot. Wow, WT Sherman pushed up super far. He does get these metal extractors. I don't know if he'll hold these long enough for them to be worth it, but at the very least, just a ballsy move. I mean, really just stepping on them and letting them know that he's not afraid to extend into their territory as much as he feels like. Of course, I'm joking a little bit there, but quite a quite an impressive move anyway. Starting up some jammers here, and he's trying to kite those maces, but they are being microed by Quad Opti, who knows better than to step them into the effective range of the commander. One option you do have, of course, is to cloak the commander and then wait for them to push into you. Interesting little back and forth dynamic between commanders and maces, thugs as well, the uh, Cortex equivalent. They do. They, they, they have the same range, effectively, which means that you essentially want to constantly be just outside of that range with your maces. I guess the maces and the thugs technically outrange the commanders by a little bit, so you always want to be just outside of that range. We do have some dragon's teeth here, but also we do have a hidden dragon's claw. Might be able to put in a nice little bit of work. Lee desperately stalling, or desperately building windmills, although I, I was going to say he's probably stalling, but in fact it does not seem that way. It's quite an overkill on these advanced solar extractors. They're rather dense in metal, so you really do need to start reclaiming from the front line or otherwise find some way to maintain your metal production, because as a backliner, he really doesn't have it without going for energy converters. Maybe a good idea would be to build couple of these solar panels and then a couple energy converters and then a couple solar panels a couple energy converters build it up that way reclaimed his windmills while building more windmills at the same time that is funny <laughs> interesting decision but i guess maybe just wants to move them over a little bit look at pamabama teching compared to jezithir all right let's take a look see pamabama up to a fusion reactor he's eaten up his t2 lab so that he can afford the fusion reactor. That's always nice, of course. Versus if we look at Jethix, which is... Sorry, who are they talking about? Jezthir. Dark green. You see, he is significantly behind in economy. Does not have his T2, or rather his uh, 
what is that called now? The fusion reactor up. Doesn't have any energy converter. He is quite a bit behind. Clueless might be a bit too far. Just doesn't have his build order quite as refined. He also, I don't believe, has been focused entirely on ecoing. It looks like he's basically trying to uh, trying to build units at the same time. Jess was blaming his team last game when he never built units. Oh, that is unfortunate. I would not recommend blaming your team for stuff like that. And, um, metal storage, interesting. I always wonder why people build metal storages when they don't have the metal to to fund to building a metal storage. It really just doesn't make sense to me. Especially a T2 metal storage. That's going to give you 10,000 metal. I, I, I see no reason why you would need to store 10,000 metal. Essentially the entire game. You want to be spending your metal, not storing it. And if you're, if you're at your metal cap, you want to be giving it to your teammates, right? It does you no good to store metal when, you're, when you could be giving it to your teammates or using it yourself. Just a, just a weird mindset. This front line is getting very complex. A lot of units pushed out from blue here. I guess giving Naps reconfigured. I'm still debating on which name I want to go with for him. Still giving him time to reclaim his commander, which went down here in the middle. Looks like a self-destruct on the commander here from Maws. I don't hate that with the increasing presence of units over here in the bottom corner. It is going to be able to allow him to tech if that's going to if that's going to be what he goes for, or if he's just going to pump out a bunch of units. Either way, I think it's a good option. Just there has the T two. I think it's time to start deconstructing it. He does indeed, actually. Well, on this side, we do see up to two fusion reactors now, as well as two advanced energy converters. You can see that's the. Uh, that's the pathway that I suggest taking as well. Going up to three now because he has all this wind to support it. If we click on all this wind and see, about plus 300. That's very nice. Plus this. I guess gives you up to 400. And you get a little bit extra from these from these fusion reactors. Which he's using to build the, the other fusion reactor, of course. Also starting an anti-nuke. Very nice. And you can see just the, the professional way that he's sort of allocating his build power around, like, you know, putting a little bit of build power into the into the anti-nuke, a little bit of build power into the fusion reactor, and a little bit of build power here and there to, well, build more build power. It's a very, it's a very nice way of distributing your build power so that you don't stall on any one resource too hard. Now that being said, the wind power is dying off, so one of his advanced energy extractors closes up. But it should pick up here eventually, once he's focused on his fusion reactors and his anti-nuke system. Anti-nuke is finished, and all of his resources are finally going to be able to focus on going into this fusion reactor. And this third one should be up pretty soon. Now, interesting, he's going for a third fusion reactor as opposed to jumping up to an APHIS. I guess he figures that's a better way of getting up there. Eventually, he's going to end up at the end goal, which is four energy converters, and then moving up into an advanced fusion reactor, or advanced, yeah, an advanced fusion. We do see this. It's about to finish up here. And then he switches to producing a, another advanced energy converter. Starting to think about a little bit of defense. And also, another interesting note is that he doesn't let his his T2 constructor work on any of these projects. He just starts them and then lets the construction turrets finish them. That's a nice way of saving time. Yeah, I don't know why they're calling stuff out in, in game chat. That's a bit, a bit unsportsmanlike. Not supposed to do that. But other than that, it is questionable what Jess is going for here. His plan is a little undefined. A bit less well thought out, I guess. Looks like Maw's in a bit of trouble here. More than a bit. A big cluster of medium tanks here. While we were well while we were gawking at the phenomenal eco of Pamba Bamba here. A bunch of medium tanks have broken through and trashed the economy of Maws. As well as the front line. Looks like his teammates are able to help him wrap it up. But that is still a tremendous amount of damage. His factory goes down, and he's left with one constructor to his name. Hopefully his teammates here 
Oh, actually, he does have a bunch of res bots, so they're going to be able to resurrect a lot of this stuff. Uh, but a bombing run comes in. Phenomenal. Look at that. You have, I mean, this is just professional right here. You have a bunch of scouts going in. You have a bunch of fighter craft going in. And then you have the bombers going in. Wow, just reducing that whole place to rubble. You move past. They scouted all this, so they know where they're dropping their bombs. Blow that entire base up in one swift bombing attempt. They're going to move along this way. Ah, oh, and I love what good bombing looks like. Just absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. A little bit of uncertainty here, but that's because he didn't manage to keep one of those scouts alive. So he's sort of scouting as he goes here. He doesn't really know what he's looking for. He does find this T or this uh, this fusion reactor though, and he starts bombing that as well. Doesn't look like he's going to get it, but he's definitely done more than enough damage. Lee sent back to the Stone Age, and uh, Ma is completely taken out of the game, 100% removed from the game. Not a not a build fa or not a factory, not a metal extractor, not anything left to Ma's name. In fact, all of his units get absorbed into Vendra Vandrials, Van Vendrali's army. Oh, and in fact, Lee taps out as well. That's quite unfortunate. But also very, very frustrating. So I, guess, I suppose I don't blame him. Sneed taking over for him. Sneed the top player as well as the bottom player. So that's going to be a difficult amount of micro to handle both of those situations. But he does have a nice little army that he inherited for his troubles. This front line is maintaining an interesting little... What would you call this? I guess a, a, it's sort of a static push here. They, they've got a whole bunch of maces hidden in the corner. By they, I mean Quad Opti. should share that with you for all my audible listeners here. Audio audio listeners, my, not my audible listeners. I'll take that sponsorship too, though. <laughs> and W.T. Sherman holding this, this, I guess, high ground here? Well, he has the high ground. Don't try it, Anakin. Don't try it, Quad Opti. I have the high ground. Probably what he's thinking here. A calm self-destruct to do some damage up that hill. Is that what we just saw? <laughs> what a what a high level move there to, to plan that. I mean, how do you even What a bizarre move, but it totally works. Looks like Jester is in fact blaming his team. That is uh That is interesting. I wonder if that's a pattern with that character. Might be someone to look out for on the ladder. Maybe just, uh, you, you know, you see you're on his team, you might just spectate that game. They tried to get me to play in this game, and I decided to spectate it because I saw how high the skill level was, and I decided, you know what, this will serve as a phenomenal tutorial to anybody who's looking for how to play on DSDR, which is, of course, one of the most popular maps, because it is a pro map. Or rather, it's, it's featured in almost every tournament, it just makes a, a, an appearance almost all the time. It's very well, well balanced and it has a huge array of possible positions to play, so definitely one of the most popular. See another huge bombing run here, just tearing apart most of this base. At this point, not really worried about being efficient with the bombers, but more so just causing mayhem. Any, any, any kind of damage will be worthwhile. Bombers moving in again for another run. They're going to be stopped by these fighters. Oh, maybe not stopped by these fighters, actually. And they won't be stopped by the fighters. They will continue their damage, continue their rampage, moving on as if nothing had happened. One of these marauders being brought down by this medium laser turret. But the second one manages to finish up the job, and a third one arrives for reinforcements. That bombing has been killer. You can see what good bombing looks like, just compared to, you know, poorly executed bombing. Good bombing can really just change the tide of battle. I mean, he wiped out essentially two players, and now a third, just just with T1 bombers, just a spam of T1 bombers alone. Of course, it requires good execution. You have to know what to target. You have to know how to maneuver them properly, and you have to know how to scout as well, so you're not accidentally bombing the wrong thing. All of which, by the way, you can check out any of my bombing tutorials for Cortex or Armada. Well, there's only one for each, but. You can check out the, the one that corresponds to the faction of your choice, or both, if you're really interested in knowing what you're up against with the other faction. Go ahead and head down to the Beyond All Reason tutorials playlist and check out some of those. I'm sure there's plenty of good information for you. We see this massive army of medium tanks moving against each other. Waves of Crashing Steel. It's a title I stole for another video. 
Well, I guess it came up with it, so it's not really a stole. You see this armed extractor. These things actually put out a tremendous amount of damage. Really, it's something to be feared. Surprising how much damage those put out. Sniad has loaded his commander into a transport. We'll have to see what the idea behind that is. There's, uh, there's a lot of anti-air here. There's a lot of light laser turrets. All those marauders have a nice little anti-air attack as well. His commander went down. I'm not sure what... Not sure what happened there. Once is nice and oops. I'm not, I don't, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what happened, but uh, apparently something did. This Marauder, I love that when they get into these back lines, they also start picking apart the air wall. It's such a small detail, but it really does end up helping quite a lot because it's just one less bit of damage that the fighters have to do in order to do a good amount of bombing. Now, getting into the back line here is really annoying. Especially if they're going to be able to trample on any of this economy stuff. That one gets taken down by a D-gun, but these ones manage to make it to the back line. And they're going to be putting out quite a lot of hurt. Tearing down that gunship with ease with their light rocket launchers. And they managed to blow up that fusion reactor. And stop the micro though. They can keep going. Looks like the Eastern team has all but all but given up hope. Few players left. Sneed, Vandrolis, Jezthir, and Quadopti holding in there as best they can, but the onslaught of units has just been too much. And we can see now, it looks like with four fusion reactors up, interesting that he went for four fusion instead of you know, two advanced fusion or something like that. It looks like he's settled here to just resign the rest of his economy to producing units. And indeed that's what he does, spamming out ticks as well as marauders. It's a wonderful option. The resign vote comes out for the Eastern team, the Blues. Uh, they're resisting it. Looks like they want to go down in history. The geothermal is lost. John Deere. Joe and Deere. Go and Deere. Pushing up the front line very nicely. Building these nice little light laser turret walls. Very good for business. Making sure that this artillery has enough ground support so it doesn't go and run. Marauders pushing up viciously, tearing apart anything that they can find. It looks like the wave of steel has reached the blue base of the enemy. Those Janus is laying down an impressive amount of firepower. They only get to fire once, maybe twice. But when they do, it hurts. Not really enough against those T2 tanks, though, is it? This metal extractor being a huge pain in the butt because, uh, well, it can put out enough damage to stall off those T1 units. It also has a tremendous range, which is also just as dangerous to those T1 units. See, those rockets it fires are quite powerful. One more has dropped from the team. Down to the remaining three players. But this is looking devastating. Huge amount of fighters coming out here with some T2 bombers, which are able to just ravage any of these remaining T1 buildings. We have a mixture, actually, of T1 and T2 bombers. That's quite interesting. They switch targets and go after the fusion. And they will get it, as anticipated. He does scout the fusion over here, but there's also a flat cannon tearing apart some of these units. But it's not going to be fast enough to tear apart those T2 bombers. They're coming in hot. They drop the bombs, and the final bomb from that T2 bomber, the Blizzard, was able to rain on Sneed's parade. Looking to drop some bombs on Sneed directly now. A little, little salt on the wound here. We do see some Marauders pushing in as well. Taking out the anti nuke, Trying to aim for the commander while staying out of its D-gun range. And they get the commander. Looks like there must still be one up. Well, yep, looks like Vandrills. The last remaining commander. The Bastion of the Middle. The lone guard against the waves of Marauders, Bombers, and other steel crashing on his defensive shores. See, he's got all these T2 craft, but no really effective way of pushing into this line without taking just as much damage as he's doing. Although it's as best as he can do. These bombers here being shot down by the defenses, but not before they manage to get their payload out of their bomb bays. Marauders coming out now. Well, coming out is a loose term there. More so being resurrected, brought back to life, and sent back to the front lines. Front lines, rather. Reliving a constant nightmare of war and agony. 
something to be said about the morals of these battles, but I guess they're all robots, so it doesn't really matter too much, does it? Are they all robots? I think they're all robots. I think for everyone's sake, we can just pretend they're all robots, whether they are or not. Now, we do see Sniad has actually built up a little bit of a factory over here. Trying to keep himself in the game as long as he can, but there's not a lot of hope here. And indeed, the final commander decides to self-destruct, resigning to end the game. Very well fought. Very hard fought. I think that bombing definitely made all the world a difference, and I think that's, if anything, just an example of why you want to be able to do that effectively. Pamabama, though, of course, stealing the show with his Marauder Tick production in this phenomenal eco example. I sure hope you all enjoyed. I sure hope you'll consider subscribing because it uh, it really does mean a lot to me. We've, we're up to over 200 now, which is phenomenal. I, I really I really couldn't ask for more, and especially just how kind and 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 well, just just uh, just wonderful people that I've that I've seen interact so far, and I really appreciate that. Anyways, enough of my uh, tearing up. You know, don't want to don't want to cry on your guys' wonderful game here. Congratulations to the Western team, and to all my lovely viewers. I will see you all in the next video.